Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Rania. I'm an uh, elder here at Jacobswell Church, and uh, I just want to welcome you to uh, our debate tonight. Um, really appreciative of uh, all you who've come up from uh, parts in the south and all over. Um, glad you can make the trip. Uh, on a personal note, I want to also thank you. I know many of you, both from Straightway as well as Jacob's Well and the Providence Academy uh, area, that uh, your prayers for my wife and uh, for myself. Uh, good news is that she is back and uh, she's doing well. So I really appreciate your prayers. Oh, that you have to Tonight's debate is, uh, it, it sounds odd that um, it is, is it okay for a follower of Jesus Christ to celebrate Christmas and Easter? Um, it, it sounds uh, almost trivial. Uh, for most of us, if we've been born and raised in a church, or even just in the United States of America, uh, we think that that's like a no-brainer. You just, you just go and you celebrate. In fact, I think... Uh, as Pastor Dow puts it, that's two of the three pillars, he says, of Christianity, Christmas, Easter, and Sundays, right? Is that your, that's your standard? And, and our hope tonight is just to look into Scripture and, and to see we both come from different perspectives on this. Um, I, I am of the uh, opinion that it is a good and right thing to do. Uh, Pastor Dow has a, a different opinion, and he'll uh, certainly give it. Um, but... We want to do this in the spirit of uh, investigative truth. Uh, we want God to be glorified in this. We know that God is not to be trifled with. We're reminded of the times where uh, God's people have tried to do their own thing with worship. Uh, Aaron's sons who uh, played with uh, unauthorized fire, God struck them dead. We think of Ananias and Sapphira who also uh, lied to the Holy Spirit and were struck dead. And when we come before God, he's a real and uh, we want to honor him and worship him, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. So it's with that um, uh, spirit uh, that we come today to debate, um, because we want to honor uh, God. So I want to say welcome. I want to thank Pastor Dow especially for coming up all the way from Tennessee. And uh, David Fiorazzo from Q90 is here to moderate. Uh, he's going to come and talk a little bit about how the pattern of it and also pray for us. Pray already? Does it come to that? <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm just going to run down what's going to happen here. Both uh, Mr. Jung and Mr. Dowell are going to get 20 minutes each. They're going to take turns. After each gets 20 minutes, then we'll have an eight minute segment where I think we'll go two minutes at a time. Two minutes, two minutes, and two minutes a rebuttal, presentation rebuttal, or however that's going to work out. Toward the end of that, we're going to have a question and answer on Christmas. I believe we're doing Christmas first, correct? Correct. And then we'll have a short break. We'll come back in, same format. Then they'll switch whoever went first um, the last time, the next session. The other one will go first, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And then in an eight-minute time frame, we'll do the 2-2-2 two, two, two rebuttal, and then a Q&A at the end on Easter. So and it's pretty basic. That's the way we're going to do it tonight, and um, that's all I need to say. I want to give these guys as much time as possible, so let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is impossible for you. Thank you, God, that you are the God that gives wisdom and understanding to men like us, men and women like us, and we pray, Lord, for wisdom tonight. We also pray that you would reveal your truth. We pray for uh, patience, and we pray for um, a loving debate, yet informative. And uh, we ask that you would be glorified, and that people would be drawn to you, and we could come away with a better knowledge or understanding of our brothers and sisters, and what they believe, and what we believe, and Father, thank you so much that your word is true. Uh, we love you and honor you tonight. We lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Mr. Jung, you're going to go first. And you've got 20 minutes, sir. I have 20 minutes. I felt bad today because I, I <clears throat> we got home last night uh, late and I didn't have an opportunity to bring a Christmas cookie. 
uh, to Pastor Dow. So I, I did put on my Christmas tie, though. So kind of remind you of a tender Tennessee Christmas, right? Anyway, uh, Galatians chapter 4, starting in uh, verse 4. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is an amazing an amazing part of the God's gospel that we have been saved through a son. God sent his son, born of a woman. And uh, for most of us, the idea of coming to church to, to worship that God who sent that son on that day, um, it, it sounds like, uh, to, to challenge that seems weird. What I want to do is kind of give a proof here of why it is proper uh, to celebrate uh, Christ's birth uh, in a yearly fashion, in a, in a feast. Um, and, and, I, and I do this first conceding a point to Pastor Dow. And here's the point. There is nowhere in Scripture that commands us to do it. There, there's no place in Scripture, Old well, Testament, New Testament, that says you shall celebrate the birth of Jesus on a regular basis. I'll concede another point. I don't think he was born on December 25th. Um, I think you preached on that, didn't you, today? Um, I, I don't believe he was born on December 25th, but I'll also tell you that it, it, uh, it doesn't really matter what day he was born. Um, so let me, let me get into the proof. The psalmist says in Psalm 105, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. What we see here from just this one verse, and there are many verses in the Bible that plead for us to remember the works of God. And how are we supposed to remember the works of God? Well, one, we just saw a song, and it instructs us to sing. So one of the ways we remember the deeds of God is to sing. Sing a song to the Lord that, that uh, talks about those deeds. When it says to sing a new song to the Lord, it's referring to those new acts that God gives, uh, that He breaks into our history and does things, and we sing about those new songs. So, so one God commands songs. The second one is, uh, I'm just using uh, Joshua chapter 4 as the people are coming into the promised land. God commanded them to put 12 stones into the river Jordan so that they would remember what the Lord had done. Anytime their children or their children's children would come by, they could tell them, this is where we cross, this is what God has done. Of course, there's also the feasts. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover reminds the people that by uh, holding these feasts, they, re they remember what God has done for them and bringing them out of Egypt and into the... Um, and then there's the Tabernacle, Feast of Tabernacles, um, also about remembering God's provision in the wilderness. So there's just three things, so songs, stones, and feasts, are ways that God commanded uh, people to remember his works. But the Bible is also filled with times in which human beings, man, has decided they're going to do something to remember God's works. Uh, first, we mentioned songs. People compose songs to remember his works. Um, we continue to sing new songs, even in our church, uh, you know, I'm an elder here, we have to approve those songs, I'm not always happy with a lot of the new songs, but we do, we sing new songs to the Lord. But even in, the, in scripture you see, uh, you see uh, stones being used, and it's, it's a human idea. Think of 
Samuel, taking a stone and setting it up between Mizpah and, and Shannon, called the name Ebenezer. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. And so the people of God can look to that pillar, to look to the Ebenezer, and remember that God has been their help. We also see Genesis chapter 28, verse 18, uh, where Jacob had had the vision of uh, Jacob's ladder, right? The, the uh, angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And he takes the stone that he'd been sleeping on and he set it up as a pillar and anointed it. Uh, he renamed the place Bethel. And we see later on in uh, Genesis 31 13, God addresses Jacob and says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise and go from this land and return to the land of your kindred. So we see in the example of uh, uh, Jacob uh, putting up the stone, God uh, seeing this as a, a good thing and addresses him from that. But what about a feast? Can, uh, can man make a feast and celebrate on a regular, uh, regular time and, and it be pleasing to God? Well, there, there's an example. If you recall uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, was a Greek guy who decided that uh, he didn't like the fact that the, the, the Jews were not worshiping uh, his gods. He came in and forced them, tried to force them to uh, sacrifice pigs and uh, worship uh, the Greek gods. And a revolt happened. Um, they had desecrated the temple, uh, sacrificing a pig in it, bringing idols into it. We read in 1 Maccabees, uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 2. After the Maccabees uh, defeated the Greeks, you hear early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month of uh, Chislev, in the 148th year, they arose and offered sacrifice as the law directs on the new altar of burnt offering that they had built. At that very season, on that very day, that the Gentiles had profaned it, it was dedicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and worshipped and blessed heaven who had prospered them. So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and joyfully offered burnt offerings. They offered a sacrifice of well-being and a thanksgiving offering. They decorated the front of the temple with golden crowns and small shields. They restored the gates and the chambers for the priests and fitted them with doors. There was very great joy among the people, and the disgrace brought by the Gentiles was removed. And here's a key verse. Maccabee, 1 Maccabees 4.59 Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of uh, Kislev which normally takes place in December. Uh, Jews today uh, celebrate this as Hanukkah. And the wondering is, okay, so they decided to make a feast. God had done this wonderful thing in delivering uh, the temple from the heathen. Uh, they dedicated it. If you remember the story, the menorah was lit miraculously for those eight days of dedication. But it says here that the, that the people decided that they were going to do this dedication celebration every year. God did not command it. They decided it. The question is, is it okay? Was that okay to do? Well, we see in the Gospels, John chapter 10, you see that Jesus goes to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. We see in uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 22, when he's in Jerusalem, this is at that time, of the Feast of Dedication. It took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. So, <laughs> so we see that Jesus approved of it. He, he didn't talk bad about it. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, say you guys were wrong to do such things. Uh, he took the opportunity uh, to teach in the temple area. So let's be real here. The dedication of a temple that was destined for destruction, um, that was temporary, um, that Jesus judged, that Jesus were told its destruction and said that its destruction in the Sermon on the uh, Mount of Olives 
uh, was going to be a sign that Jesus had all authority. Um, that comes from his reference to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. That the, that the birth of Jesus, the birth of Jesus was much more important than the temple being dedicated. So from my perspective, my perspective, although Christmas is not commanded to uh, celebrate or to keep, um, I think it's a good and right thing. That, that the church could decide, hey, God has become flesh and lived among us. He has saved us from our sin and from the powers of darkness. That it is a good thing to remember it and to remember it by keeping a feast. So, if it was okay to, to celebrate the rededication of the temple, it ought to be okay for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have a mic to drop. Um, it's, it's around my, my, uh, my ear here. Um, but, but I will say, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that Pastor Dow has some things to say about this idea of celebrating Christmas. You might have issues with celebrating on the 25th of December. I think he has issues with trees in our homes. Uh, the 12 days of Christmas, perhaps. I think I saw something where Yule logs were uh, not looked on favorably. Um, Santa Claus. Let's just say we'd agree on the Santa Claus thing. If you want to bring it up, you can. But I, I'll just go, okay. I don't think Santa Claus has anything to do with Christmas or Christ's birth. Um, so, my take on it is, is this. Because the Bible doesn't explicitly command us to celebrate Christmas, we don't have to. We don't have to. Uh, I know that in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they say that this is a feast of obligation. If you're not celebrating Christmas, that you're sinning. Um, I'm a Reformed Christian coming out of the Protestant Reformation. And I understand that it's to be uh, putting, you're trying to bind the conscience of people with something other than the Word of God. And, and I think that's wrong. So it, it, is, it is not obligatory for people, for Christians, in my view, to celebrate Christmas. But I think there's good reason to celebrate it and, and to, to hold it. Now, as Pastor Dow comes up and uh, we'll, we'll talk probably about a lot of the celebrations of Christmas. Um, I, I will say that many of the things that we probably do need to be re-examined. Um, it, it seems more and more that Christmas becomes an excuse to worship something other than Jesus Christ and his birth. Uh, it becomes a celebration of material goods. Um, it becomes a, a way of feeling good. I, I know people who come to church on Christmas and Easter. They think somehow that makes them faithful Christians. And that is not true. And that is not true. It is good for us to come and examine these things and these practices. So, I know I have a little bit of more time. Six minutes. Six minutes. I will concede that time uh, to Pastor Dow, or if we want to add that to our question and answer time at the end. Oh. Now you're trying to drop your mic yeah. time. <laughs> Well, I saw already. Go ahead and drop the mic because he pretty much preached before me. <laughs> he conceded the debate already from the very beginning. So I guess all that's left for me to do is to go ahead and inform you um, in reference to where this thing comes from. The sources, your sources, um, that actually explain where uh, Christmas uh, come from. And also the idea uh, is it okay for us to make a feast to the Lord? Make a feast to the Lord. Now, in John 10 chapter, he speaks about exactly what Mr. Young brought about the Feast of Dedication. And, of course, that was a time of war because of the Greeks. The Greeks were actually um, abusing our people. Uh, we don't eat pork. We don't do those things. The same thing that our ancient people has done before. And um, with that in mind, uh, they rose up in arms. And they conquered their enemies. They slaughtered their enemies. They slaughtered their enemies. And they themselves called it a feast to the Jews, a feast of the Jews. Now, what's happening with Christmas, because the associations with Christmas is so linked 
to heathenism and so linked to paganism that the scriptures teaches us that we ought to not learn the ways of the heathen according to Jeremiah chapter 10. And that we should distance ourselves because no lie is of the truth. And no truth is of lie. We cannot sit there and, and coexist or intermingle any type of worship the same way that anybody outside of this covenant does and call them a feast to God. But this would happen once over in Shemot or Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verse 5. Oh, uh, Moses had went on up to the mountain again to receive the commandments of the Most High God. And he heard, and um, they heard reveling down in the camp. And while they heard reveling down in the camp, uh, they had taken all the earrings and the gold that they had gained from Egypt, the wealth that the Most High God allowed them to come out of Mizraim with. And what happened was, is that Moses checked them when he came back down on why this happened. And what happened? And Aaron turned around and said that it just jumped out of fire. The golden calf just jumped out of fire. But before that, Aaron had made a proclamation in the fifth verse that this was a feast to the Lord. And what did the Almighty Yahweh, the Most High, wanted to do to his people for creating a feast that he never did sanction and never did ordain when he had already laid out the outline of the way that he intended and wanted to be worshipped. Over in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and we'll go to Deuteronomy 12 and, and read exactly what the word says in that as well. But he wanted to kill his people for making a feast. He wanted to kill his people, and if it wasn't for Mose standing in the gap for him, he would have annihilated all of Israel and started all over again. So this is the reason why that we can't sit there and, and, and try to say that because we had a victory over the Greeks, that we made a peace, and it says it called a peace to the Jews, but they made this and they called this a peace to the Lord. That's the same thing that the Christians are doing when they say that there's nothing wrong with us to celebrate the birth of Christ. It's a festival. It's a festival to where you sing the trees. You sing until the night. You actually give yourself over to the same reverie that the same pagan is the same form of worship that is so closely linked together that the heathens do that you can't even pull them apart. The similarities are just literally stifled. Now he had already conceded that Christmas is nowhere in the Bible. Just that alone right there finishes the debate. Because if Christmas is nowhere in the Bible, then why do it? Why even celebrate it? Um, nobody knows the day that Jesus was born. No, we don't know the day Jesus was born. But then why do we call it the birth of Christ? You can see that it's not Christ's birth, but yet still, when you are doing these things, the illusion that you're putting out and the approval that you're putting out to the rest of the world is that it's still okay. And people are still believing in the manger scene. They still believe in that three wise men actually came and showed up um, to me with him, and he never did show up at all. The wise men didn't even show up until Jesus was a child. Now, Yahweh had spoke to the prophet Amos, and he said in Amos 5.21, I hate and I despise your feast, and I will not smell in your solid assemblies. Though he offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take you away from me the noise of your songs. Silent night, oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. He says he hates these things. He despises them. For I will not hear your melodies of your vows. But let judgment rain down. Let judgment run down as water. And righteousness as a mighty stream. That's what the Most High clearly says. Paul, the Apostle Shaul, to the assembly of Korea, says, Israel, wherefore you need to come out from among them, my people, and be ye separate. To be ye separate is to have no association. If the world loves Christmas. I submit to you that the atheists love Christmas, the Satanists love Christmas, Islam, Muslim love Christmas, Christians love Christmas, 
The whole world is immersed and baptized in Christmas. Almost every culture in the world loves Christmas. And if we are actually participating in these things, that means that in function what we're saying, or with our mouth we're saying, we don't love the world, we are walking lockstep with them. We are actually guilty with them. Because there's no separation. There's no distinction to determine who y'all's people really truly are. So, it says, Wherefore, come out from them, be ye separate, said Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I also submit that the reason why that a lot of people are sick in the church today is simply because they won't obey what God says. They will not do exactly what he says. And if you, if he was your God, he said he would heal you. He would deliver you. First John two fifteen says, Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'll say it again to get it, make sure it sits deep down in our heart. If the world love it, God is not in it. No way say that's before God. How you put it in there, after, how you make an appeal to emotion or appeal to intellect or appeal to not. He is not in it just because you put him in it. <clears throat> so let's just think here for one minute. If we celebrate it, we're being very presumptuous to think that he will receive it. There are no secular church records which indicate that around this time and season, December 25th, there was any Christian or Israelite observance all the way up until the third century. So that means that the apostles didn't celebrate, the ones who walked and talked and slept and ate with Jesus, nor did they uh, compromise. Nor did they try to say, okay, we are going to actually celebrate these holidays and do these holidays in order to uh, convert the pagans and the heathens. They didn't do that. They put distance from them. The idea is for us to come to him. Now, Colossians 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and give thanks to God the Father. That doesn't mean that you go out and create or you borrow from something that has nothing to do with the Most High God and then put him in it and because you get a fuzzy feeling that he's already in it. That's, that's called a, what Peter called a damnable heresy. So this is what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with compromising preachers. We're dealing with people who have literally no backbone to stand on what the Word of God says. We're dealing with people that, don't, that despises his commandments. Jesus said, full well, you reject the commandments of God, you may keep your own traditions. And that's exactly what's going on. If it's not a tradition of God from the Word, if it's not a tradition passed down through our ancient Israelite people, the apostles and the prophets, and the first and second century assemblies, then it comes from another source. It actually comes from another source that I submit to you that is not of God. The definitions, and let's get some sources in here. Uh, about Christmas and, and the etymology of it. The Oxford English Dictionary says Christmas, Christ Mass. The Mass of a Festival of Christ, the Festival of the Nativity of Christ, kept on December 25th. So whether they say that they don't believe it is, but if you're still celebrating it, if you're still participating in it, I'm sorry to say this, but I do truly understand that whenever you have a debate that you're not going to please everybody, but if you are in any way, shape, fashion, form participating in this, you will receive of the same pledge that the book of Revelation says in 18.4. Now, so the Oxford English Dictionary clearly says that you observe these festivals, these times, and these seasons. Now, since there's no record and it's already been conceded, um, he pretty much has taken away half of my job. So we will go into Christmas and say and ask this question. Since Christmas does not come from the Bible, then where does it come from? Okay. Well, that's a good fair question, D. So let's go ahead and hit this. The Encyclopedia Britannica, which is a reliable source, said Christmas, December 25th, known, first known as the uh, have been the celebration in Rome in the second quarter of the first fourth century, when it commemorated the birth of Christ. You see what it's associating with? When it commemorated the birth of Christ. Uh, there was, as of yet, no Christmas in the course of the 4th century. The celebration of December 25th was adopted in the East, and except in Jerusalem. And it became a day when the birth was commemorated, and January 6th retained in connection with the baptism. 
So, again, I like to say that his sources is already saying that it is a commemoration of Jesus Christ and his birth. Then, in any way, shape, or form, you relax the actual law, statutes, and commandments of obedience, and you participate in this, you even sanction it, you even try to get with these people in any way, shape, or form, you become a protector of their sins. Christmas, according to the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, says that Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. Iranians and Tertullian omitted it from their list of feasts. Origin glanced perhaps at the discredible imperial naturalist inserts. And it says that the scriptures, sinners alone, not saints, celebrated their birthdays. So not only Christmas, but only sinners celebrated their birthdays. And I'm sure some of you still do that today as well. The World Book Encyclopedia. In AD 354, Pope Liberius of Rome ordered the people to celebrate December 25th. He probably chose this day because the people of Rome already observed it as a feast of Saturday. So, let's go back here to Maccabees. When these people made their own particular feast days, it was not connected to anything pagan whatsoever at all. It wasn't even associated with it. But when you talk about Christmas, you're making an association with paganism. And then there's this old saying, guilt by association. It was observed as a feast of Saturn, celebrating the birth of the sun. So whenever you participate in this, you relax this, you're actually sanctioning people celebrating the birth of the sun, and it's not the S-O-N, it's the S-U-N. And this is coming from world sources, credible sources here. Was Christmas, was Christmas, Christmas actually was not even celebrated in America until the actual 19th century. And the feast was just so full of reverend and debauchery and so much of sickness that even outlawed it. But let's go over here to the law. Let's see exactly what the Torah says. Let's see what the mind of Yah is. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 28, the Most High said to his spokesperson, Moshe, observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with your children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of of the Lord. When you are making feasts or relaxing and saying there's nothing wrong with it, you are going out and creeping and your own things, and because there's no king in Israel that you can't physically see today, we make the same mistakes that they made in Judges, every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. Continue on verse 29, when the Lord thy God shall cut off the nation from before thee, whether thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwell in their land, Take he to thyself that thou or you be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before thee and that you not inquire after their gods saying how did these nations serve their gods even so I would do likewise thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God for every abomination was the Lord uh, which he hated, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters, they have burned in the fire of their gods. What thing soever I command you to observe, to do it, thou shalt not add thereunto, nor diminish from it. And I submit to you that Christmas is an addendum. Christmas is an addition because you put Christ in something that he ain't never been in, even though you say with your mouth and honor him with your mouth and say that we don't believe it, yet by not condemning it, one sin completely and separate and divorce yourself from it, you are really truly with it. Let's go into the green trees here for just one second. Jeremiah 10 1 says, I want you to hear the word of the Lord speaking unto your house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands, the workmen with an axe, and they deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails, and with hammer that it move not. Green trees 
have always been associated with heathen idolatry. Yet God hates worship done by green trees. As a matter of fact, he says this in 1 Kings 14, 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins. And with that which they have committed above all their fathers had done. For they had also built them high places and images and groves and every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. Let me stop there for a second. Anytime a nation, anytime a people adopts any type of these customs that these pagans have, there is something that follows. We live here in America. And look what America has done. The, uh, in 2015, they sanctioned Sodom. And now you, in this church right here, if a Sodomite comes in here and wants to be a part of this church or play on the organ or preach in the pulpit, you cannot deny them. Because you will have your Bible or C3 tax them status pulled from you. Also, with these green trees, it also is associated with child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. And with this child sacrifice, notice what we're doing now in this country. Instead of waiting for the children to be born, we're actually shooting them up with saline. And we're killing them in the womb before they were even born. Before they even had an opportunity to be born. The prophet Isaiah had warning that we should all take heed to this day. And he even covered artificial trees that don't even rot. Isaiah 40 verse 17, all the nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted as him less than nothing in vain. To whom then will he liken God? And to what likeness will you compare him? The workman metal a graven image, and a goldsmith spreaded it over with gold, and cast silver chains. He is so impoverished, that means poor, in the Hebrew from 5533, that he has no obligation offering his sacrifice. He chooses a tree that will not rot. That means that's an artificial tree. He seeketh unto him cunning workmen to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 7, Neither be ye idols. As were some of them as it written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What do they do during this time? They sit down to eat and drink and they rise up to play. I can see the rest of my time. Mr. John, two minutes. Appreciate that. Number one, uh, the, the problem with what was going on in uh, Exodus chapter 30 was they were making a graven image, which was forbidden. Um, the, and that's why it wasn't acceptable. Uh, it's true that they, from their mouth, they said, hey, look what we're doing. But God expressly forbidden uh, the making of images. Jeremiah chapter 10, talking about the uh, tree, was that they were fashioning it into something else other than a tree. The Christmas tree is, uh, comes from Boniface. Boniface uh, was the uh, uh, missionary to my people, the Germans. Um, he went and he realized that uh, the people of Germany were worshiping these pagan gods. And uh, the issue was is that they worshiped them in groves, living trees, living trees. Uh, he came to the uh, outskirts of a, of a village on Christmas Eve, uh, knowing that child sacrifice was going to happen. Just as Pastor Dow said, a lot of times child sacrifice and, and trees are very uh, common in, pagan, in the pagan world. Uh, Boniface said this, he said, Here's the thunder oak, and here the cross of Christ shall break the hammer of the false god Thor. And he walked in the midst of them, disrupted the sacrifice, and preached the gospel to them, and took an axe and chopped down the tree of Thor. And the people were amazed that nothing happened to him. And he preached to them about Jesus Christ, about his sacrifice uh, on the cross, on the tree for them. And the sacrifices were done, and they commanded them, look, here's your new tree, the little fir tree. Cut it down. Take it in. It points to heaven. Remember that Christ was born uh, that you don't need to sacrifice anymore. The people came to Christ. My people came to Christ. The, the issue was not that uh, in, in these pagan German areas, was not that they uh, worshipped dead trees. They worshipped the living trees. The Christmas tree was chopped down and brought in to show that Christ triumphed over the gods. Time. 
That was it. You guys decided to go from eight minutes to two each. Here we go. All right. Okay, again, I mean, I have nothing but almost honor and respect for Mr. Young because he's actually doing my debate for me. <laughs> he's actually agreeing to all the points that I actually want to debate. He's taking away out my notes. So what we have to do is go again back to sources because the idea is, is to put distance between all this nonsense of, of, of associated and relaxing the fact that we are actually really truly associating ourselves with paganism, heathenism. Again, the Cyclopedia Britannica. The traditional customs connected with Christmas have developed from the sources as a result of coincidence and celebration of birth of Christ and the winter pagan agricultural solar observance in midwinter. In Roman, the world Saturnalia, December 17th, was a time of merrymaking and exchanging gifts. December 25th is also regarded as the birthday of the Iranian mystery god Mithra, the son of righteousness. Call your encyclopedia says the tribe of Constantine. After Rome, December 25th, the day of celebration of the feast, possibly about 320 to 353 AD, by the end of the 4th century, the whole Christian world will celebrate Christmas on that day, with the exception of the Eastern churches, or the Eastern assemblies, where it was celebrated in January. The choice of December 25th was probably influenced by the fact that on this day, the Romans celebrated the Mithraic feast of the sun god, Naturalis Solus Invictus. And that the Saturnalia also came at this time. Yes, and now he's preaching for me. <laughs> it was chosen, yes, because of it. Because Christ conquered. When, when would you want to do it? Would, would, you, would you celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ on some arbitrary days? Pick February 2nd. Who cares about February 2nd? Everyone in the world is celebrating a false god. The Church of Jesus Christ used to actually be aggressive in this. They're saying, no, Jesus is the true God. Jesus is the one who saved the world. Jesus is coming. He's conquered all. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Not Mithras, not Saturn, not any of those things. Why not pick that day? It would be as if, if as our world is going and we're celebrating a... Uh, uh, football, you know, the, the, the Super Bowl is like the biggest party in the United States of America, and the church decided we're going to celebrate the ascension of Jesus Christ from now on, on Super Bowl Sunday, and what happens is years later, when football is not even played anymore, and, and we're having a broadburst at our uh, ascension celebration, and all of a sudden, someone from straightway is going to say, that's pagan, because you're eating a broad, well, hey, it's pig, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're, you're turkey problems. Not... And, and then saying some of this, and so this is a genetic, uh, genetic fallacy. It's like looking back and going, oh, look, there's a similarity here, therefore it's wrong. That, that's not true. The, the church was, was conquered. Here, here we have, uh, the, how many of you guys celebrate Sol Invictus? Now, how many have never even heard of Sol Invictus until tonight? Why? Because Christ conquered. Right, amen, right? The, the Christmas tree is no longer about, uh, the trees aren't about four, right? It, it's just like saying that we shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't do anything on Thursday because it's Thor's day. Well, no one even knows that, no one thinks about this. It's, it's, uh, it's again from scripture. I'm still, I'll get that. <laughs> He's preaching my points. <laughs> I love it. All right. Why do Christians insist, insist on holding on to the celebration? It is an insistence. While some of you may not celebrate the celebration, you do do everything else that's associated with it, thereby still saying that you are a pagan Christian. Now, the one I'm picking up is that this assembly or this church, in some way, shape, fashion, form, has no association with Christmas, I assume. What is that? You have no association with Christmas. Oh, you love Christmas. All right. So there we go. That's all we need. Mark 7 5 says, Then the Pharisees asked him and said, Why do our disciples walk according to the traditions of the elders? Because Christmas is a tradition. 
but ye eat with bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto him, Where are the lies prophesied to you hypocrites? As it is written, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctors of commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold your tradition of men, as the voice of the prophets and many of those other things. And he said unto them, For well, you reject the commandment of God, and you may keep your own tradition. This is double talk. This is the way a serpent talks. Well, the, the disagreeing with it on one side and having an association with it on the other. That ain't the way y'all operate. Colossians 2 8 said, You be aware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, Christmas is a tradition. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And Mr. Young has already conceded twice that Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus' birth. You didn't say that. You didn't say Jesus was born. He's a 25th. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Time. Time. <laughs> Time. Hosea 2 17, for I will remove the names of the males from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. Zechariah 13 2. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut the names off the names of the idols of their land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I remove the land from the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And this is what's happened. Everywhere the church has gone, the church has conquered. Jesus is conquered. Jesus' name is above all names. Jesus is celebrated at Christmas. Not Sol Invictus, not Saturn, not any of them. No one cares, no one hears of them anymore because Christ is conquered. Now it's true that in the modern day there have been people who are trying to take Christmas and make it into a secular holiday, Santa Claus and all that other stuff. I'd encourage you, uh, people of God, not to, uh, uh, not, not to give in to those things, but to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Yes, celebrating the Feast of Christmas is not in the Bible, but Jesus' birth is all over it's predicted all over from Isaiah, to you, uh, 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 a son is born, a child is given. Uh, a virgin shall be with child. But we, we see it fulfilled uh, in the Gospels. You see, you see the, uh, the story of the Gospels. I, I started off by reading um, in Galatians chapter 4 uh, how important it was that, that Jesus was born. Uh, Christmas, that is, the birth of Jesus is everywhere. Is it appropriate to talk about it? Is it appropriate to read scripture about that? Of course it is. How often is too much? Is one day a year enough? Is, is one day a year okay? I mean, we can, we can do more of it. It's about Jesus. Hallelujah, right? It's about Jesus. And so, because we, the church decides, hey, let's celebrate, let's, we don't know the day he was born, let's pick the 25th because it's the most pagan day of the world, and, and let's see who is victor. Jesus is. Right? If, if, if we were we were saying to celebrate Christmas by having a sacred grove to Thor out in your backyard and, and go decorate it to celebrate Christmas, that would be one thing. We're chopping down the trees and I'm going to go sit down. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, we've got to really, truly exercise some autonomy here and, and use some critical thinking while you are going to listen. Remove the names out of your mouth if there's no association with them. Divorce yourself from you. It's amazing that we say we celebrate Jesus' birth, but yet Jesus gets no presents. We give them to each other. It's not an apostolic union. The event, yes, I can see, will celebrate. No doubt about it. But nobody after that ever celebrated any birthdays in the Hebrew Israelite Bible. The Bible says that God's looking for true worship. Yes, and the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So we got to ask ourselves a question. Is there such thing as Christmas? No. But yes, in the pagan sources and, and the pagan arena. Did the uh, apostles who were walking, and talking, and slept, and ate with Jesus, did they celebrate his birthday? No. Did the first and second century up to the third century celebrate? No. So what are you doing? You're doing something. We're trying to put Christ in it, but the truth is, you're celebrating a heathen pagan holiday. No matter how much you twist it in your mind and try to convince yourself that you're not. That is the truth. Mm. 
Are we still going? You have two minutes if you want. Do we have two minutes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The celebration of birthdays. There's no commandment in Scripture that says thou shalt not celebrate a birthday, is there? Is there? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Um, in, in the fourth century, what we see is, is in the missionary activity of the Church of Jesus Christ, people were believing that Jesus was a myth because in their viewpoint, only uh, only uh, uh, kings and you know uh, gods who have been made flesh, whatever you might say, well, they, they would celebrate their birthday. So how can, how can Christians not celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, we have his birth story. And his birth is uh, uh, celebrated, you might say, on a, on a worship service uh, on occasion when the, the text of the day happens to be in the, found in the Gospels about the birthday. So part of the missionary activity was is to have a date in which they celebrated his birth, to make known that Jesus is real. He was a real, real person. He was a real God. He's a real king. Right? It had a missionary uh, 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 aspect to it. Um, do we claim? I, mean, I think some people believe that yeah, he was born on December 25th. There, there's nothing that says that he was born on the 25th. Probably was not. Again, it was intentionally put there uh, again to, to for missionary purposes. Um, there was something else. Um, yeah, pay, pay <laughs> What I, what I would say is this, is I, I think that, that Pastor Dow has the, some right sense in this. If, if it is not of Christ, if it is truly pagan, then we shouldn't be doing it. But the, the things that we're celebrating here is not, it's not against, it's not going with paganism, it's going against paganism. It, it's, as if, it's as if David chopping off the head of Goliath and taking it as a trophy is somehow associating himself with, with paganism. Right? Then, then he takes the sword of Goliath, which he chopped off his head, and he brought it to the temple and stayed there to say, oh, that's wrong because a pagan used it, and we shouldn't do it. Right? A, a tree that's been chopped down from a grove that people used to worship uh, uh, for in, um, it is not pagan. It's the concrete of paganism. All right. I, I didn't bring up Sam, but he did. What's that? I didn't bring up Sam and you did. Uh, you mentioned something about Sam, didn't you? Yeah. Alright, you mentioned something about Sam, so I can see you that because I had about five pages on Sam. <laughs> so I let them go. Alright. There's a slogan that's out in the world called WWJD. Mm. What did Jesus do? Mm. Whatever Jesus did, Christians don't do. Christ, Christ is our Passover. Yeah. Luke 22, verse 1 says, now in the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover. Of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he was our Passover. As a matter of fact, the book teaches that we should celebrate his death. We should show forth his death until he comes. That's what it's all about. That's the reason why he was the Passover lamb. But y'all divorce yourself from that because you don't keep none of the laws. Prescribed laws, statutes, and commandments that are already lined out in Leviticus 23. You have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You have the Feast of Passover. You have the Feast of First Fruit. You have the Feast of Pentecost. You have the Feast of Trumpets. You have the Feast of Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, which everybody who says that they follow that Bible should be doing. But instead of doing that, we exalt traditional holidays in place of His holy days. Now, if you are keeping them, I should suggest that you should keep them and divorce yourself away from anything that has any satanic pagan history that's even associated with it. Uh, if you guys uh, both agree, we can go to the question and answer. Yes. Okay, do you, we have a live mic out there? Is yeah. someone going to bring it up? Down Where, the microphone? Can you do it? Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. All right. Gentlemen, right All right, brother Ryan, I got a yes. Couple, you know, it's gonna be quick, but I just have a question. Consider, you know, Pastor talk about vain traditions. Yes, like washing hands. Right. I assure you, sometimes I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> But one thing I want to bring up, Brother Ryan, you know, in that is 2 Corinthians 
614 where it tells us to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and also in it you know when we look at that it makes a very specific point all right it says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and so that that's you know one part all right and let me give you the second part and then you can answer the question because the thing is christmas is a vain tradition is also a falsehood which i want to make sure that i bring that out so that you can have your way with that because that's where we stand you know it's as brothers believing in christ and knowing that we're trying to stand for christ i stand with pastor on the, the resurrection the death the burial I, I stand with those things because that's what's most important and in revelation 22 verse 14 it says blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life so doing commandments has association with going back to the beginning and having a right to eat from that fruitful tree that we need eat for everlasting life. But then it also says, right here, my brother, that they may enter through the gates into the city for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. And then the last part it says, and whosoever loveth and make it the lie, whoever practice falsehoods. Yes. So we can't practice falsehoods because we won't have right to the truth of life. Yes. Go ahead, my brother. All right, so, so the Boniface goes into the tree, uh, into the, the, the sacred grove of the poor, chops down their tree, uh, chops down their other trees, and uh, preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are they having fellowship with poor? Yes. Are the, they are. Yes, because you're practicing the falsehood. See, that there's no distinction between, see, when, when we keep Christmas, it's the same thing they did. They decked the tree with silver and gold. And they fastened it. They took it from the forest and they fastened it. Yeah, they, so they also we, fashioned it to an idol. The, the idea here is, I mean, if you look at the translation of it, a lot of people talk about it not a, as a chisel. Like they're, they're actually making it into the shape of something. It's not, it's not a tree, Brian. So here's the thing. I, one of the reasons why the English people like freaked out about trees in the Victorian age is because they're not German. I mean, they, this didn't happen in England. It happened in Germany, right? The, where, where, the, where these people, my ancestors were trapped in darkness, worshiping uh, false gods, and they were ch practicing ch child sacrifices. And the, the preaching of Boniface, it, it, it brought the gospel to them. And, and the, the power of, of uh, these false gods of Satan, because there is no truth, there is no form, it's, it's demonic, right? Those, those powers were gone. They're not having fellowship with them. They're, they're, they're idols that have been cast into destruction. And again, it's, it's like, again, I brought up David, David bringing the you know, severed head of Goliath. Is he having fellowship with the Philistines? No, the Philistines hate David. Why? Because he's slaying them. They killed their, 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 their hero. So, so this is this is kind of so the the idea that the, the these these are pagan roots is kind of a modern idea, right? It started in the 19th century where people started going, oh, we think that all the religions are the same, and they started writing books about the sameness of religions and saying, well, look, Christianity is the same as as this and this, and then they they, they bring up and it, and it doesn't mention the fact that what Christianity has done is it's, it's it's conquered these gods. Christ has conquered it. These gods don't exist. So it's not fellowship. It's not fellowship with them. It's it's defeating them. It's defeating them. Well, there was, you had a second, what was the second question? It was about practicing the falsehood, where he's you know where it was made known to uh, John, you know when he heard the voice. That outside the gates are going to be sorcerers and murderers and idolaters and all those and they are outside falsehoods and so so if I went around if I went around and I and I started preaching to sorcerers and they repented of their sorcery and all their 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 stuff right I'm not having fellowship right I'm bringing them into the kingdom well here's here's the point is is that our actions you're going to have to give account for everything we have done 
in these bodies, yeah. all right? And so, so if we are living in this world and the word is telling us to be ye separate and come out from among them, what are we coming out from among in the world? It's the traditions yeah. of men. Yeah. It's the, the pagan practices. Yeah. It's the, you know, the falsehoods, the, the worship of idols. It's all the things that the world esteemed. Right. When he gave Israel the commandments, he said the nations was going to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Yeah. But us, and the they, they all the serve us. are going to be brought into the, into the kingdom. Sir, we, we need to move on to the next question. Otherwise, okay. this will be a debate. And yeah. we need to give Mr. Dowell another opportunity as well. Any other questions? I have so, one thing to say. He is risen. He is risen. Man. Man. I, I think we can agree on that. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a member here at Jake as well. Appreciate you coming up here. Um, I actually came out of a tradition that um, that didn't celebrate Easter or Christmas. Um, and so um, one of the unique things about it that the tradition I came out of um, was they would look at Christians who practiced um, or observed Christmas and say they were lost, right? That they must, they must not be saved. That they're clearly not saved. So the question for you is, in your understanding, is the celebration or the observance of holidays, is that a salvific issue? And if so, I'm all, I also kind of understand your understanding of a passage in Colossians, that being Thank you, honey. <laughs> he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in, in questions of food and drink, in regard to the festival or new moon or Sabbath. Thank you. <laughs> he thought that's true. He didn't thank me. Yeah, he thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and this was for Mr. Dowell. Alright. Colossians 2 8 says, Beware of this thing man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit up of traditions of men, up of rudiments of the world, and not up of Christ. I see the angle that, that you're coming from because Christ did spoil and make a show openly of these principalities and powers. He did conquer them. However, he's the one to conquer them. He gave us power. He said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He also equipped us with the power to be able to cast out devils. He said in Mark 16, verse 17 and 18, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. We are supposed to be actually doing this conquering work because he equipped us with his Holy Spirit. The powers of Satan still exist. Hollywood even shows us that. The power of Satan is still, Bible is still living. That's why we are a Bible living deliverance church. Not only a deliverance church, but the same miracles that have that, that been gone on of all. Uh, we're doing the same thing. Jesus said, The works that I do, you shall do. And greater works than these shall you do. Why did he do all this? To give us the power and the ability to be able to fight against the kingdom of Satan. So by saying that they're defeated and they're still flourishing and you're sitting on your pews doing nothing, that ain't accomplishing the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is in power and strength and the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of heaven is about. And we vividly oppose the kingdom of heaven by having people that come from all over the world to get free from demonic forces and spirits. People get, to get healed. So yes, we should be fighting against it. What I'm hearing is y'all saying that they're already defeated, but when I go out here on these streets, I see it everywhere. I see the symbolisms. I see the signs. But my question was, is the observance of holidays, or um, is that a salvific issue? A salvific issue. Salvation. 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 Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And the reason being is, uh, think about this for a second, okay? The Most High were completely aware of the propensity of man to worship and serve him his own way or their own ways. And so what he did was give us laws. He gave us rules. He gave us guidelines. You know, all of us have to remember that this book is not a Gentile book. This book is a Hebrew book. 
He came from my ancient people. I drove up and I noticed up on the sign it says, Jacob's Well. Well, I thank y'all for welcoming the sons of Jacob. <laughs> Again, what we should be doing is being obedient to what the Most High said and did, what he prescribed by the prophets, and we should do exactly what Jesus said. Yeah, that's, right. that's what we should do. Right. And if Jesus and the apostles and nobody in the first, second, and third century church, if they didn't entertain any of this, then why should you? Right. What was happening is we are relaxing the laws of God. And we're walking in lockstep with these people. And they're feeling comfortable because when all of y'all sheep are dirty, great, the world feels comfortable. The world feels good, so we should divorce ourselves from anything that has any resemblance whatsoever at all, heathenism and paganism. Anything has to do with idolatry. These people freely admit, I quoted to you sources that freely admit that these things come from it, and yet still, instead of divorcing ourselves from them, we're justifying ourselves in them. And Christ says, you are that that justify yourself among yourself, but God knows your heart. Yes. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Is there a question for Mr. John? For either. Well, we're trying to alternate. Go back. Yeah. There's another question from the audience online as well. Oh, I'm taking it. I have a feeling to ask me. So <laughs> either um, you said that your ancient people, you said the Germans, they went over and they chopped down this tree, right? Yeah, they chopped down and then they put one up of their own to point to... They chopped it down okay. and then brought it in as a trophy. And then brought it in as a trophy. Yes. Okay. My question is this. If we are to worship the Father, right, and we are to obey Him, yes. why would we be doing the exact same practices as the heathens? For an example, Molin, right? If he's going and he's and people are throwing their babies into the fire, I'm not gonna turn around and say, Well, Jesus Christ won, let's start throwing our babies in the fire too. I don't want to do that. Okay, so I don't understand how it is copied the exact same way. I think it's quite simple. My question is this: yes. if we are to walk as Jesus walked, yes. why would we do anything that the scripture has? no reference of, but everything that he commands for his people to do forever and forever and to all their generations, nobody wants to do. That's my question. I just don't understand. I think it's quite simple. Sure. So I, I think some of the things that you're, you're referring to uh, on the things that we should do are, are the things that, like Pastor Bell talked about the, the feasts, right? The, uh, the feasts that have been pointing to Jesus Christ and, and now have been uh, Christ has come and, and the, you, you go to the temple and offer the sacrifices you, you go to the tabernacle and offer the sacrifices what's that do you, do you, do you sacrifice no I don't know okay. it was a sacrifice but, okay, but, the, but, you're, the, the, but the Torah commands that you sacrifice right no. I mean the Torah says that you should do talking about the sacrifice, yes. but with Jesus being our perfect sacrifice, that's why we want to not do it. That's being a problem. That's like he's saying, Jesus, you're not good enough. Right. That's like he's saying he's not good enough. Amen. So, so you're saying that, that the, the scripture that, that was for all time wasn't necessarily for all time because it waited the Christ. That's not what I'm saying at all. So okay, go ahead. Explain. I just explained it to you. Jesus Christ was our perfect Sacrifice. Correct. So there's no need for me to go and sacrifice. And that's exactly what Paul was speaking about. Yeah. Why would you want to go back under that bondage Absolutely. And, 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 and try to get a lamb and go all the way across the world to sacrifice this for the atonement of your sin? Jesus Christ wasn't Amen. So I'm not going to go back under that bondage of that part of the law. But as far as his commandments of eating what is abominable, doing the practices of the world, I'm not going to look the same. The truth of the matter is this. Christianity looks just like the world. There's no separation. If you do the exact same things that the world does, there's no deciphering. So I want to know what is the difference? What, what, sure. Where is the difference in it? Sure. The, 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 the difference is, is that, that we're all sinners. The law points to our sin. In Christ, in Christ, 
right? In Christ, um, he, he is working on our heart, right? He's, he's transforming our heart. Look, so, what, why was the world flooded? Why was the world flooded? Be, because the intents of our hearts were evil all the time. What did, what did it say? In, why does he say he's not going to flood the world again? Why, why did he say that we're not? he's not going to flood the world again? Be, because he says the intents of our hearts are evil, even from childhood, from, from birth. Right? So, so what does he say? It says is he, he gives us the, uh, uh, the law, right? At Sinai, the covenant with his people, right? The, the law proved that we are not able to keep it. It points out our sin. He says we're going to have a new covenant. It's a covenant in, our, in the spirit, right? He's going, to, he's going to transform our heart. He's going to take our heart of stone, make it flesh. He's, he's going to renew our heart. Right? That, that's, is he going to destroy the earth? Is he going to destroy again for the exact same thing? I think we need to go to the next question to give yeah, Pastor Dow the chance. See, we, we, need to, we need to do one on the, on the, on the law. Let's, let's is there a law. question for Pastor Dow? Over there. I'm going to start my question by singing. I made up a little song. Let's imagine I'm in a bar and I'm drunk and I'm singing the song and I'm going, Let's get drunk and have some fun. Keep on drinking, we're not done. So I'm at a bar and someone's singing that or I'm singing that song. Now let's say that person comes to be a Christian. I get to know this person and they're still singing that song. I'm saying, you know what? Let's give that song some new words. Jesus died for you and me from our sins to set us free. Now I'm going to say it. If that song even came from Pagan Brooks, Brooks, and if that song has never been anything else but a drunk song to sing in a bar, is it wrong for me as a Christian to change those words and redeem it and use it to praise the Lord? And I, I address that to either of the men. Well, we, I think it's from Pastor right. Dowler, correct? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, you do have singers in the church. Sing the blues all. Matthew chapter fifteen, verse seven through nine. Hear the word of the Lord, you hypocrites! Well did Elias prophesy of you, saying, "This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips." But thou heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of me. Everything I'm here is a justification for why are you doing the same thing that the world is doing. Right. Everything I'm here. You don't have any problem with conversion because we've been converted. What's going on? We have put down. There used to be a time I used to celebrate Christmas. Teaching. Easter as well. I know what you know. But you don't know what I know. I'm a student of this word. I'm a man of truth. A man of truth. I would ask each and every last one of them and put a personal challenge to you. Go and search this subject out for yourself. Do your own due diligence. Do your own independent research and see what conclusions you come to. I guarantee you'll come to the same conclusion because if you haven't studied this, all we're doing is just back arguments, fallacies, back and forth. That's all we're doing. Until you re uh, know what this subject is about, you can make up all the songs and make up all the rebuttals you want. It still doesn't change the fact that you are doing what the world doing and you're not keeping God's peace. I for instance, how many of you in here actually keep Pentecost, the day of Pentecost? Nobody but the Israelites. Oh, we do too. How many of you keep the Feast of Tabernacles? So you slept in booths or tents for seven days this year. Then you didn't keep the feast. You did not keep the feast. One thing about Jesus Christ was, as over in John, four, or the first chapter, 14 verse, and the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. That word dwelt means he tabernacled with us. That's exactly what that word means. You cannot find nowhere in church history where the real true people who are serious about God ever lost step and walked with people who celebrated 
pagan institutions. No matter how you try to dress it up, they divorce the sexes. I don't think you can find in church history where uh, where the church continued to celebrate the, the feasts of the uh, Old Covenant. The church is I mean, you look at church history. At what point do they stop uh, keeping uh, Passover and uh, uh, Pentecost and uh, Booths? Oh, they never stop. The Israelites never stop. First Corinthians 15, Paul continues, he called on over. Christ is our Passover. Peter is one blank. And even still to this day, according to our ancient Hebrew Israelites, we never stop. We keep the feast. We keep the feast and we keep them as best as the Most High God allows us to do it. And we continue to keep growing in grace and growing in knowledge. I know y'all like grace. I know y'all love grace. I love grace too. I say it every time I eat. And I also thank God for grace. Now the Bible says in Titus, for the grace of God have appeared unto all men. And what does that grace do? It teaches us to deny ungodliness Hallelujah. and worldly lust. That we should live righteously, soberly, and godly right now. Yep. Here is present work. That's what grace does. Grace does not give you a license to go out and rub elbows and rub shoulders with people who don't even honor Christ. Yes, that's right. Oh, Mr. Mr. Young says that he, he continues to talk about his dramatic background. Um, over in, in the Encyclopedia, 1968, it says this. To these soulless observers were added to the Germo-Celtic Yule Rites when the Teutonic tribes were perpetrated into Gaul, Britain, and Central Europe. Yule tribes were following his own traditions and feasting of mortal customs to combine with the Roman soldiers, traditional years' rites, special foods, and good fellowship. The Yule Law, Yule Cakes, Urinary, and fir trees, weapons and gifts, and all of these commemorated different aspects of the five festivals. Fire and lights and symbols, warmth, lights, lasting light, have always been associated with the winter festival, both pagan and Christmas. I mean, Christian, excuse me. Evergreens, as a symbol of survival, have long associated with Christmas festivities, probably dating from the 8th century when St. Paul uh, completely completed the Christianization of Germany and dedicated the fir tree to the Holy Child to replace the sacred oak of old. Christmas Encyclopedia Britannica, 1968 edition, volume 5, page 705. Okay. Would you like to reply for about five just, minutes? Just, just, just real quick. Go ahead, and then we'll take a break. All right, all right. Yeah, a couple things. One, with, with Bob's question, I think it's perfectly fine to change the lyrics of the song and name it Christ. Um, second, uh, again, the, with the, the fir tree, I, it, 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 did it replace uh, the the oak with a Christmas tree of worship? A tree. It was again. It was it was again the the, the cutting down of the trees is a symbol of conquering of a, of, a, of paganism. And uh, which is why the Germans have always uh, uh, enjoyed uh, such things. Um, the redeeming of things and times for, for the sake of Christ when it makes sense to point to him is, is, uh, is uh, perfectly fine. What? Okay, one more? One more question. We'll take a little break and we'll get to Easter. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll 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 we have to take a break. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Young, thank you for coming today. Um, I taught evangelism for over a year. And one of the things that was interesting enough is you spoke about <clears throat> the evergreen tree being cut down because uh, it proved something. But the problem with most people when they go out to evangelize, they think they're smarter than God. God's word says that the law of God is perfect converting the soul. Now what happens typically is they use the uh, things of the world, traditions of man, to try to convert men. And we see in the Christian world, because I was one for 25 years, taught 
that what happens is we use Christmas and Easter. Oh, we got to get ready for Christmas. It's the biggest time of year to evangelize. Instead of getting our backsides out there and doing what God says, which is giving them the law, which is perfect, converting the soul. But what you have shown us today is that men use things that were not perfect to try to convert the soul. Your statement, sir. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think in the in the times I've, I've been a, a pastor, uh, as well as an elder uh, in this church, um, how much uh, Christmas evangelism has worked, and I would say not much. I, I, would, I wouldn't say. I, I think you're correct in that uh, if, if that's what people are, the churches are relying on to, to, so that people might hear about salvation through Christ, um, then, then it's probably a mistake. Most people show up to church uh, who come, the Christmas and Easter folks, uh, come because it makes them feel good. Like, I, you know, look, it, it's sentimental, and uh, it, it, you know, the, the church rolls records will now show that I showed up my two times and maybe I gave a few bucks in the plate, so they're not going to get on my back. Uh, so I, 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 I would say uh, that kind of evangelism isn't always the, the best. However, however, when, when I was talking about Boniface and what he did, I mean that was that's an old move to walk into a group of people who are about to kill a child to sacrifice to their god, and they took an axe and chopped down the tree in front of them and then proclaimed Christ to them. Um, I, I think that was pretty successful. That, that, that evangelism. The, the problem is, is that we get lazy. We get the church gets lazy of Jesus Christ. We get we get lazy, um, and we're not. We, we don't focus. I, I, I would say, you know, um, it, it is a it is a, a, a reminder that we have to that we ought to um, uh, pursue Christ at all times, and our, our times to evangelize are in our day to day life. Um, it is true that people are going to show up to church a couple times a year, and, and I don't think it would be wrong for a, a pastor to emphasize the fact that they're sinners in need of a uh, Savior uh, because they have an audience that's there that really needs a Savior. Uh, but again, I, I agree with you on the fact that uh, Christmas and Easter evangelism usually uh, doesn't work too well. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we'll take a 10-minute break and come right back, and we'll kick it off with Easter next. Okay, I want to go back. <laughs>